The instrument is here on the lower right, and then the various inlet systems, there's three of them there on that particular uh, system. You know, you can switch back and forth between these things. So there's incredible versatility to the instrumentation, all again tied to continuous flow um, inlet systems. How these work is, as I, as I mentioned, really pretty straightforward now. <laughs> and that is that you introduce a standard. So we introduce a standard at some time. We have uh, an unknown that comes in sometime later. And then you can, if you wish, have another standard um, after that. And instead of switching back and forth with the standard, you are measuring your complete standard, and then your complete sample, and then another complete standard. So it's fundamentally different, but it provides that same uh, ability to compare. The trouble is that as a from this time i to time i plus 1, you've got some possible drift in the ability of your instrument to make that measurement. right? So the accuracy still can drift. Even though precision is always pretty good, our, our accuracy can drift. And so in order to do that, we take the standard value here that we measure and the standard value there, and we interpolate across that time period. And you just simply kind of, the software draws for you a straight line between those two values. And wherever your sample is, it picks the value of your standard at that time, and then it compares your sample to that. So drift is accounted for in, over this time period by this interpolation method. And that's buried in the software. You never have to think about it as a user. But it's good to know that if you have one standard that's kind of wonky and one standard that's pretty good, your, your instrument will use both of those values, wonky or not. Right? So understanding what's happening can empower you to make good decisions about how to use the information. OK, so that's the interpolation method. This technique is, of continuous flow tech, uh, technology is applied in a variety of uh, inlet systems. Probably the most widely used, at least on the organic side, is not GC systems, but EA. EA systems, there's way, way more measurements by EA internationally, globally, than by GC techniques. So this is really the most successful, in my opinion, the most successful of the continuous flow technologies. They're, they're really doing the hard work of isotope measurements um, in, in so many ways. So the idea is you drop your sample into an oxidative environment and that converts um, organic material to CO2 uh, and nitrogen to NOx. Uh, and it can also have sulfur uh, gases released. And then there's, a, there's a subsequent reactions that can take place. In this particular example, it's reduced copper, which converts NOx back to N2. And then you've got this mixture of, of gases that you want to analyze, and they're all on top of each other, so that's no good. So we separate them with a little GC system, a little gas chromatographic system at the tail end of this that separates the CO2 from the N2 from, from uh, the sulfur gases or whatever it is you've got in there. Right? So this is, this is a continuous flow technique, and it actually includes some gas chromatography in it, even though we're measuring bulk, bulk materials. So that's a very successful uh, device. To, and and the, the discipline for a long time was really driven by people who wanted to put big samples into their EA, right? That they thought this, was, this is good because then we can kind of get a representative number for this whole thing. Um, and I'm interested in going as small as possible. So we, we work kind of in the opposite direction of the trend that the the market was taking the instrument manufacturers. So we decided to build our own instrument where we could put in small, tiny samples here and then collect them uh, and then re-chromatograph them in order to get very, very sharp peaks of a small amount. And that's what led to our device, which we call a nano EA. This is actually not entirely, none of it is really new. And a lot of this early, uh, our work is based on early work by Brian Fry who um, uh, was doing basically this, but in an offline techno uh, technique. And we just simply plugged it into our mass spec and, and uh, adopted it for that. But the idea is your EA effluent comes in here, and you run it through a cold trap. You collect the gases for a window of time. And then you switch that flow so that it goes into a narrow and higher separation uh, column with higher separation po power. And then you can separate your CO2 and your N2 and anything else. And you end up with sharp peaks. So this is about five or eight seconds wide in peak. So that's our EA peak. Um, and this, is, this little chromatogram is, showing, is the mass of 28. 
So we can see the N2 very nicely. CO2 also makes an ion at uh, mass 28. It's smaller. Um, and so just for illustration purposes of the timing, we just are monitoring that one mass. The actual 44 peak would be quite sizable. right? And so we can measure the ratios and make our isotope measurements of two peaks separated with um, uh, about 100 seconds of time, and they're you know, eight seconds wide. So that's a really nice separation power. And we're, we're currently partnering with Thermo on incorporating this design into their commercial product because I think the, the trend, the field is now swung back the other way and people want to run small samples. So, so that's something to keep in mind. And the kinds of small samples that we like to run in our nano are uh, compounds that we can isolate by HPLC methods, for example. And um, we've done a lot of work with chlorophylls and pigments that we can isolate individually by HPLC and then package up and send into our EA system. We've also looked at some intact polar lipids. We've done some work with that. Um, and then most recently, we've been working with a, a co, uh, coenzyme in Archaea called F430. So we can isolate that by LC methods and then run it on this system. My father is a retired chemist, and he used to come and do uh, chemistry magic tricks for the sixth grade when I was a grade schooler. And he would put um, hydrogen and, and, and oxygen in a balloon and then set it off, and it would really get everybody's attention. So <laughs> pretty, pretty exciting stuff. I could tell you other stories about my dad, but I think I better, better keep moving here. <laughs> OK. Um, so we have gas chromatography. Um, which is coupled to the mass spec through an interface, and that interface is oxidizing. Unless you are trying to analyze nitrogen, then it's oxidizing and reducing. Um, we're removing the solvent or that, the dilutant of the sample, and that's you know, many, many, many th times more material in your solvent than in your analytes. Um, we remove water in nafion tubing, or you can also remove it by, uh, by uh, freezing it out. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I didn't mention is that each time a peak goes into the combustion reaction reactor, you get a little explosion, right? If you have one mole of a C10 compound coming in, or one nanomole of C10 compound coming in, when it combusts, you suddenly have 10 nanomoles of CO2, right? That 10 carbon compound gets converted from one mole of a big compound to 10 moles of a little compound. And that, that actually increases the pressure uh, and you get sort of a pressure pulse right at that ex moment. And so having that open split stabilizes the flow regime. And that's, um, it also tends to st uh, stabilize the amount of gas that goes into your mass spec. So it's good for stabilizing in, in lots of ways. OK, so that's the combust combustive system. Um, in, I guess, over the last 15 years, the field of deuterium analyses in organic compounds has really taken off particularly exciting applications in paleoclimate, but it's been a, you know, used in all kinds of other fields as well. Let's see if I can get some juice. There it is. And so that system is fairly uh, simple by comparison, certainly to the nitrogen system. Again, we have a venting system. We have a separation method. And then we just have an open tube at 1400 C. And that is just simply pyrolyzing the carbon kind of turns to black carbon or char, it just sits down, and then the hydrogen is, stays as H2 and is uh, carried by the carrier gas. Uh, you, you, sometimes if there's a little bit of oxygen contamination in here, the hydrogen will make water, and so you want to remove that water, that trace water, and again, send it to the mass spec. Here's the open split uh, illustrated for you there. OK, so this is conceptually a lot simpler. Um, it's just an open tube, and you're just pyrolyzing at a really high temperature and releasing H2. Um, in summary, it is, uh, just as I said, the chromatographic separation. Um, but there's a little more complexity to it. The um, trouble is that you've got, you're looking for a three, mass of three, in a, f in a flow of four. Right? And so you've got a lot of helium flowing into your mass spectrometer. And, and, and the ion beam is not perfectly focused. There's a little bit of dispersion always. And so some of that dispersed um, structure of the ion beam of the helium will spill into the cup three. Right? So the, the way that this finally became uh, a robust technique is when the, they added a very small electrostatic lens that sort of keeps the mass four from spilling into cup three. And that's one of the secrets on, that you may not know as a user, but that really has made this possible. <laughs>
Um, one of the things that also you need to do with this is the first is to precondition your furnace. You'll need to kind of kind of pre-treat it with some carbon uh, to create kind of a glassy carbon layer or an amorphous carbon layer in there um, that helps that reducing process happen. Uh, we tend to do that by just always having kind of a throwaway compound at the beginning of our chromatographic separation. Usually it's like a C10 or C14 alkane that we just, we're not interested in it, we just, we just put it in there and we kind of pre-treat the column before any of our compounds come through. So H3 factor is a correction for the fact that in ion sources where you have H2, um, you can actually have three hydrogen ions come together to make an H3 ion. And the production of that H3 ion scales with the amount of hydrogen H2 that you have in the, in the um, ion source. So you just simply want to kind of create a regression between the production of H3 and the amount of hydrogen in there. And then once you have that regression, you can apply it to your samples. And I'll illustrate that in, um, in a minute. Here's that production reaction. You take hydrogen, uh, diatomic hydrogen ion, and react it with a neutral, and you can end up with a, an H3 um, ion and a neutral as a consequence. And that has an isobaric interference with your deuterium uh, and remember, deuterium is really, really small abundance in nature, and so even a little bit of this H3 ion can confound your measurement. Um, and it scales with the amount, so here's this an example. You can sort of vary the peak height of your hydrogen uh, standard gas and measure the ratio, and then apply that slope to uh, an, another unknown and then end up with that nice flat delta value as a consequence. So it's fairly straightforward. It's been done for years in dual inlet mass spectrometry. There's, there's no, no secret here. It's not a new thing. But it is bigger for the continuous flow techniques. The production of the hydrogen 3 ion tends to be more efficient for whatever reason in the ion sources where there's helium flow as well. So it can be a fairly large tens of per mil kind of correction. So it's important to pay attention to it. It's often in the software as kind of a canned number. And you, you I don't know, I never like to be told what to do. I don't know, do you have that, that sense? And so I like to know what that number is and I want to know who generated it and why and is it right for today and the samples I happen to be running. So if you're working with hydrogen in these continuous flow things, pay attention to that H3 correction and understand what number you're using and, and whether it should be updated. When gas gets heated up, the molecules are moving around faster and they're bumping into each other and the behavior is more viscous when it's hotter. Isn't that cool? Right? So it gets, it gets more viscous, it's slow, it becomes harder to move it through a tube when it's hotter because those molecules are dancing around to the beat of their own drum, right? They're not paying attention to where you want them to go. It's kind of like small children. So, <laughs> so, so as you're moving gas through a tube and you heat it up, your flow rate will drop for the same, if you don't change the pressure. So again, something just to be aware of. And so modern instruments, modern GC systems will have a flow control in their, some measure of flow control in their um, inlet system, uh, which, is basically compensating by raising the pressure. You can't actually control flow, but you can increase the pressure. And so as the GC warms up, the flow will drop. The systems will compensate by raising the pressure. Okay, so continuing our journey under the hood here, this is a, a diagram of a gas chromatograph. We have some kind of injector where we introduce our mixture of compounds. This, this slinky here is not a slinky, it's not a spiral, but it's actually a, a capillary tube, it's an open tube, and then it has some kind of detector. So let me show you uh, a cross section. I am actually trained in geology, so I like cross sections, but this is at a different scale than you normally see in your geologic cross sections. Um, this is a, <laughs> these are different kinds of columns that you will encounter in gas chromatography. Um, the original forms were these uh, packed columns. They're still used today, particularly for gases. The advantage is that they give you a huge amount of surface area for your gases to interact with. Right? Just massive amounts of surface area. The open tubes give you a lot less surface area, so we compensate by having longer columns, typically. And you can have on your tube um, a coating, a bonded uh, organic coating. It's kind of like a little layer of liquid on the inside of these columns. And the molecules can interact with that little layer, and that can enhance uh, your separation uh, techniques.
So these are, this is the taxonomy of columns in, um, in GCs. <clears throat> the way these work is similar to any kind of chromatographic system. You have uh, a, a moving phase. In our case, it's a gas. But in liquid chromatography, it's a liquid. You get the idea. Uh, and you, you introduce a mixture, which I've indicated with three colored bands. And then as you go through time, some flow faster than others. And eventually, over time, you have complete separation of the components in your mixture. Okay, so that's how chromatography works. Um, molecules interact with that stationary phase. Remember that little liquid coating on the inside of the tube? Um, and remember, we're, we're kind of heating it up gently, so the boiling point is helping us with the separation. And, and they get into that carrier phase, and they move. Compounds with a stronger affinity for the stationary phase will stay put. Things that are more volatile and have lower chemical affinity for the stationary phase will move through more quickly. And so you can play with physical properties like boiling point and chemical properties like affinity for the phase to tailor and improve your separation. Um, in the lab, you might have done work like this where you introduce a mixture and you can sort of watch it flow through. This is uh, a cartoon illustration of that. It's the same principle. We have, in this case, a movement of liquid through, and then a stationary phase is some kind of silica gel or, or alumina of some kind where we're our molecules start interacting and deciding do they want to move or do they want to stay put, right? And so you encourage them gradually to change how they feel about that so that you kind of separate one compound from another. Not to anthropomorphize chromatography, but that's kind of how I think about it. I'm like, come on, you can do it. <clears throat> Here's another cross section. This is a longitudinal cross section of a GC column, just to illustrate this a little bit more. You have the compounds in the gas phase are going to move. The compounds that sit down, and this is not to scale, but that really thin layer of liquid on the inside of the tube, and they will sit down in that and sort of hang out. And then they, they're actually kind of moving back and forth between these two phases continuously. And the more time they spend in the gas phase, the faster they're moving. The more time they spend in the, in the liquid phase, the more slowly they're moving. So in the end, when you're setting up to do some analyses using chromatography, it's very powerful if you understand some of these principles because you can think then carefully about the chemistry of your compounds. Are you looking at hydrocarbons? Are you looking at amino acids? What kind of functionalities do you have? Um, and so that allows you then to pick a bonded phase of your column uh, based on the types of chemistry you, you want to retain and want to move through. And then you can sort of develop a, a temperature program that gradually increases the, uh, the ambient temperature so that things become, the bigger compounds become more likely to go into the gas phase over time. That's illustrated in this next slide where we have um, uh, two chromatograms. One is done what is called uh, under isothermal conditions, so it's always the same temperature throughout the run. And the second one is a, a program temperature where you're gradually heating up the GC environment. So under the isothermal, you can see here, this is C10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? So the C15 is not really volatile, and it's just kind of, all right, if I have to, it's coming out, right, re really late. Whereas in this lower one, it's temperature program. So as the run is going forward, as the carrier is moving through, the temperature is also increasing. And so as it increases, you're now reaching the boiling points eventually of each of these components, and here's C21 all the way out there, and you've got nice sharp peaks and they're coming out kind of smoothly and quickly. This is, this is this really powerful metric called resolution, and I want you all to know this because, well, it's insanely simple, but it's also really, really powerful. And, and the, re, the separation is measured by this distance, um, or so the difference in time that they elute, um, divided by the average width of a peak. And so you can run your GC, your sample through a GC and measure this, it's not hard, and then you can tweak the conditions, maybe the ramp rate or maybe the flow rate, and then see if you've improved your separation. And it's a really nice and very uh, standard way to handle kind of the tinkering of conditions to optimize uh, for a particular application. So if you're working in a lab where there's a GC and some other student has been running it and they hand it off to you and you think, oh great, I'll just use their conditions, well now you don't have to, right? You can measure your separation and decide, is that right for my samples? Can I tinker with this, the conditions and make this a little bit better? All right, so now we've separated our compounds, we've burned them up, we're sending the compound uh, products into the mass spectrometer. 
And we've got this problem that we've got a lot of carrier gas going into an instrument that was designed to have really low vacuum, right? Really low pressure, <clears throat> or high vacuum, low pressure. So there's been some modifications to, based on the original sort of mid-20th century instruments that allow us to accommodate this flow of gas. And they start with what's happening in the ion source. In the ion source, you have neutral molecules. They come in, and then they get smacked upside the head by a high energy electron. And that gets them so upset that then they lose their own electron, and they become a positive ion, right? And so that's all very good. But we have now not just the CO2 or the other compounds we're interested in. We also have this helium in there. So you're making a lot of helium ions as well as the analyte. And so a couple of modifications, just so that you're aware of them. They've kind of opened the source so that it's not so um, constraining and, and neutrals can escape. Uh, and then the important thing is that there's this differential pumping. And that's illustrated in the next slide. And differential pumping is. Uh, characterized by two pumps, a big one and a little one. And um, sorry, I got that. No, I'm sorry. This is the big one, and this is the little one. So you have all of the helium plus your compounds coming in here, a lot of neutrals. They get pumped out by the big pump. And then there's a slit. The exit slit at the end of the uh, ion source is the only connection between these two chambers. It's the only physical space where molecules or ions can go through. And so the ions get shot through here. And this is now kept at low vacuum by a second uh, pump that's a little bit smaller than this big one. This one has to be big because it's handling big volumes of neutrals. This has very few neutrals, and it can hold the flight tube in the mass analyzer environment where the magnet is and all that at very low vacuum and very steady vacuum. So it's a way to kind of accommodate these bursts and big flows of helium and keep the business end of the instrument nice and steady. It's not a new technology. It's been around a long time, but it was brought into isotope mass spectrometry in the 1980s when we began working with the continuous flow methods. <clears throat> when I was a student, we wanted to open up these sources. And so I literally, this isn't me. This is just a picture from the web. But I literally took uh, the rings off the source and got a hacksaw and cut rid uh, holes in them. <laughs> to open up the conductance of the source. They now do that for you commercially. <laughs> but that was, that was our attempt to kind of open it up, let it breathe a little bit. That's fun. OK. Um, this is uh, an illustration of um, uh, the circuitry of a Faraday co collector. I just want to say a couple of things about how we handle signal processing slightly differently in these, these instruments. Um, there's um, these, of course, where's Sean? You know, who's my hero, right? J.J. Thompson, right? Love this guy. So um, he, in his early instruments, he developed um, initial mass spectrometry using photographic plates and then later replaced them uh, with a Faraday cup, which we now use today, um, moving us from mass spectroscopy to mass spectrometry. Isn't that cool? So cool. Right, anyway, so the Faraday cup collection are, collects the ions. They come in, and a current is fed to that cup to neutralize the positive ions. So you have electrons kind of coming in to match, in quantity, the number of positive ions hitting your cup. And you just measure the flow of electrons, which is otherwise known as a current. Right? So you're just measuring that as your, and that's actually what gives you your isotope analysis. So that hasn't changed. But what has changed is how we deal with that incoming information from the flow of electrons. And what, what happens is that the, the signal is amplified. So you're actually, a current is measured in, um, uh, oh, what's a current measured in? Amps? Nanoamps, right? So it's measured in nanoamps. But the thermo instruments give you your signal in volts, right? So you're actually a step removed from what you're physically doing. And the reason you're measuring volts or uh, it's giving, expressing it to you in volts is that the it's being converted from uh, current to voltage in the, in the circuitry. And then it's actually converted into uh, digits. So it's an analog signal because you're continuously monitoring the current. And then it's converted into digits by a, uh, a, a digital converter in the circuitry. And then that is sent on to your software and collection. So you actually end up with discrete points as a function of time, not a continuous signal. And so one of the decisions you have to make is how long do you measure slices of time to collect enough points to be meaningful? And uh, what, what 
uh, this has done is allowed for sort of variable counting periods. It's nominally maybe a quarter of a second. Um, it, we're actually now working with much shorter time periods. We're working with 50 hertz in some of the new work that we're doing. But that slice of time captures a bit of your signal. And remember, your signal is constantly changing because you're working with peaks and valleys. And so you have to think about the integration period that will best capture that variation in a meaningful way. So that's one of the changes that's happening. Um, and then, as I mentioned at the onset, we introduce our standards before and after our sample peaks, not interspersed with them. So that's one of the other big changes. So this. Um, illustrates some of the calculations that have to go on with the, the peaks as they come in. So remember, they're now little points in time because of that um, voltage to frequency conversion. And we have digitization of the signal. And so each the software now looks at that change in the signal as a peak comes in and says, OK, I don't know when a peak starts, so I'm going to have to figure this out. Oh, a peak will start when the slope changes. right? But there's always a little bit of noise in there. So the slope is always changing a little bit. So it's, it's a slope change and an amplitude change, typically. And that triggers the software to start integrating across the peak. So that's one piece. And you can change the slope parameters uh, and the amplitude parameters both before and after the peak and tailor them if you have asymmetric peaks, for example. And then the, the next part of this is. Um, involved in uh, kind of correcting the background, sort of subtracting background signal. And that's done, again, from sort of backing up from before the peak and then doing some calculations of an average and then extending that across the peak itself. And there's, there's a number of now algorithms sort of buried in your software on the commercial instruments. And it's like pulling teeth to get the company to tell you what they actually are. But they're all doing something similar uh, to this. All right. Here, so here's, here's another. Um, part of what was really unappreciated before we got into this sort of endeavor of measuring molecules coming out of a GC column. And that is that there's actually a chromatographic effect at the level of isotopes. There's, there's mass sensitivity to the separation process itself. And this is not new. This is well known in, in that we all know about vapor pressure isotope effects, right? You know that the lighter isotopes of water will evaporate preferentially to the heavy isotopes. That's basically the same thing that's happening as the compounds are sort of moving back and forth between the gas phase and the liquid phase in a chromatograph. And so the software corrects for that by sort of figuring out the offset between the two, uh, the, the isotope mass and the, the parent mass. And, and there's, if there's a time offset, it kind of shifts them back on top of each other. That's illustrated here. So uh, this is a, these are peaks coming out. And you can see the ratio in the top shows this high isotope value and then a low isotope value, all for the same peak. So what you're actually seeing here is that the first half of the peak is enriched in 13C and the second half is depleted. And that's because the 13C is actually more mobile under the chromatographic conditions that we worked with here. That varies depending on the setup. And then you just simply sort of pick the top of the peak. And there's a little bit of a time shift between mass 44, or mass 44 is at the top, mass 45 at the bottom, and that time difference is what's shifted. And so the calculation shifts, so everything lines up. And then the deltas, the ratios and the deltas are calculated. 